Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 30th season, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished, what they're planning for the future. It's a wider net than just writers, however. If you have an idea for an artist of a different brand who might be a guest for the writer's block, a sculptor, a dancer, a musician, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd be glad to get your suggestions. I also want to point out that this original programming and all the other original programming out of 1623 Studios is a result of cable access television. Don't be tempted to go to DISH. You stick with cable, you stick with the writer's block and everything else that's original out of here. Now tonight we're taping our second show in the new facility, downtown Gloucester, and I'm happy to say this evening we do have a writer, a very well-known nonfiction writer, historian, who has written many books. We're gonna to touch on many of those, I hope all of them, and also a brand new book that's coming out in six months, a furious, a furious Sky. The guest is Eric J. Dolan. He's from Marblehead, although he used to work in Gloucester. And I'm going to use as part of my introduction a paragraph on the uh, folder, uh, the jacket of one of his recent books. Eric J. Dolan is the best selling author of Leviathan a Los Angeles Times and Boston Globe Best Book of the Year. Also, Brilliant Beacons and When America First Met China, among others. And I'm gonna mention a couple of those others. Smithsonian Book of National Wildlife Refuges, Snakehead, A Fish Out of Water, and uh, When America, for, I, okay, <laughs> I got them all. Eric Dolan. Thank you for coming down. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm excited because I just read one of the uh, books that we didn't mention, Black Flags, Blue Waters, about yeah. pirates. Yes. And uh, that's pretty exciting, especially because Gloucester figures in this in a, yeah. couple, a couple of places. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we get to that, or the new sure. book, uh, where did you start getting Interested in writing, or when in did writing? you start getting interested? It's probably in high school. When I was in high school, I started writing op-eds for the local newspaper. I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. And I thought at the time I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau when I grew up. I was really into marine biology. Really? So when I was a senior in high school, I wrote a 150-page report on the mollusks of Long Island Sound, which is the seashells of Long Island Sound. Whoa. And two chapters of that report got published in a malacological journal. So I was writing op-eds, I was writing sort of science stuff, and I thought, it, I, want, I thought I wanted to be a scientist or a marine biologist. I went to college, I got a master's, I got a PhD in public policy, and that, at that point I wanted to be a professor of environmental studies. But by the time I finished my PhD program at MIT, I was no longer interested in being a professor. I loved teaching, but I didn't really want to write the kinds of things I knew I'd have to write to become a tenured professor. So, but all throughout that entire period, I was always writing for professional journals, for newspapers, uh, yeah. for magazines, and I always loved writing. And With then you, I, on marine biology? No, not just marine biology, sort of slice of life stuff, marine <clears throat> biology, a little bit of history, duck stamp program. I mean, I wrote on a whole bunch of things. And I remember in the late 1990s, when I lived in DC with my wife, Jennifer, at the time, um, uh, I, I had been writing all along. And the one thing that I liked most about all the jobs that I had was when I got a chance to write something. So I said to my wife, you know, I want to be a full-time writer. And after she stopped laughing, she <laughs> said, okay, let's think about how we can get to that point. And actually, I shouldn't say she was laughing because her grandfather was a very famous writer who only became a full-time writer when he was 59. His name was Harry Kemmelman. He wrote Friday the Rabbi Slept Late and a whole murder mystery series. But his first book when he was about 57, 58 landed on the New York Times bestseller list. So he's able to quit his job as first a- book. First book. Well, that was his first book, yeah. but he was 57 or 58. And um, it landed on the New York Times bestseller list. 
He was able to quit his job as a substitute teacher at that time. And he wrote 12 more books. He sold about eight or nine million copies of his books during his lifetime. So my wife knew what the writing life was like. And I, I told her, well, don't worry. We don't need to worry about me becoming that famous. But she said, you know, keep working well, you're at it. You're, you're coming very close now. <laughs> keep, keep working at it. And uh, I did. I worked at EPA for a while. I had a whole bunch of jobs. And then I worked doing accident reports at the National Transportation Safety Board to see what writing was like within a government setting. And uh, I said, you know, I really want to write history books. I've always loved history. And my wife said, well, if you put aside a year's worth of your salary, you can quit your job and try writing full time. And it took me many years to do that. And one night in 2007, after Leviathan came out, The History of Whaling, she said to me, we were watching House, which is a TV show. And she said to me, you can quit your job. And I was at the time working at the National Marine Fisheries Service here, here, here in Gloucester. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I, I have confidence that you can make a some semblance of a living and you've put aside enough money so I feel comfortable having you quit your job because my wife has a full-time job and we had two young kids at the time. And uh, I was a little nervous, but about three weeks later, I told the people I worked with that I was going to leave. And I did, and that was 2007, and I've been a full-time okay. writer since then. Is this your first book? No, no, that this was probably my sixth or seventh book. I've written 14 books, but this is the first book with a major publisher that ah. did really well. I mean, this got reviewed <laughs> in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. It, it did really well. It earned me some money. So it took it a while gave to me credibility. Oh, sure. Credit, yeah. It's always a battle. Yeah. I mean, who knows? My, my career, you know, it's gone sort of like this, it could go like that. You, you never hold, know. Hold this up. When, <laughs> this came out when again? Two thousand seven. Leviathan. The Leviathan. History, the history, history of whaling in America. Yeah, in, in America. that came out in two thousand seven, and I've pretty much written a book every two years since then, almost every two years. There was a little break in there after uh, one of my after books. Leviathan. After came. Leviathan came, what, what which one came out? Oh, I don't have it here. I didn't bring it. It's uh, Fur, Fortune, and Empire, which is a history of the fur trade the in America. Trade. That came next. After Fur, Fortune, and Empire came this, and then when America, when America fur, first met China. Which is about the China trade. It has a lot to do with Salem. Apropos and, yep. present politics. And of course, yes. this, this area, this Salem, area. Salem and Gloucester. Oh, yeah, huge connection to this area. And then, and then after that came Brilliant Beacons which is the history of lighthouses in America. And that, of course, has a lot about Gloucester and yes. the North Shore and the rest of the country because we have had well over a 1,000 lighthouses over time. And then after the lighthouse book came the pirate book, Blue, Black, Black Flags, Flags, Blue, Blue Waters. Waters. Yes, this is the one you, sent, you were good enough to send me a review copy of. And yeah. uh, I, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I was reading it. And Great. I want to stop at this book for a minute. Okay, I, sure, sure. Tell me about... John Quelch. Oh, John Quelch. He's uh, the most famous and probably the only pirate to come out of Marblehead. During the uh, War of the, uh, the Spanish Succession in 1702 to 1713, there was a drop-off in piracy in the American colonies. But there was one good example of piracy, and that was John Quelch. He was a lieutenant on a privateer that was supposed to go north to Acadia and attack French ships. But... He and his compatriots decided to essentially mutiny while the ship, the small ship, was in uh, Marblehead's little harbor. And they locked the captain in his cabin. They took off. The, cab the captain either died of natural causes or I think he was killed. They pitched him over the side into Massachusetts Bay. And instead of going north, he went south to Brazil, this which was Quelch, Quelch <clears throat> him and his buddies. They went south to Brazil, which was in the midst of a uh, gold rush at the time. They plundered a number of ships. They came back to Marblehead in 1704 with about 10,000 pounds worth of gold dust and other assorted treasure. And he thought that he and his men thought they were going to get away with this because pirates were often welcome in the colonies and, and, before that time. And he had a letter saying he was a legitimate privateer and he could take... Right, but French they vessels, right? right, but they knew that he when he came back, it was abundantly clear that he didn't uh, follow the privateering course, 
and he became a pirate and the owners of the ship became quite concerned about this and they essentially turned him in. There was a major manhunt and, that and, went. And yeah, I want to make sure you mentioned Well, the, the manhunt went, went all the way from, from Boston up to the Isle of Shoals and part of it took place in Gloucester because uh, Samuel Sewell, the witch judge, his brother, Stephen Sewell, who was a military official, came up to Gloucester because there was word that some of the, pir the pirates had gone to yeah. Gloucester, which they in fact had. But by the time he got up here, the pirates had taken off on a, the Laramore Galley and gone to the Isle of Shoals. So while the pirate chasers are in Gloucester, they have dinner at a local captain's house and they decide they're gonna raise a group of men to get on board one of the local ships, a pinnace, and go after the pirate. And Stephen Sewell gathered together a bunch of people here in Gloucester. They took off from Gloucester Harbor. They went north to the Isle of Shoals. They cornered the pirates, and the pirates actually gave up without firing a shot. They were brought back to Gloucester. Two of the pirates escaped in Gloucester, and there was a manhunt in Gloucester where they captured those two pirates. So ultimately about 25 or 26 pirates were rounded up, not all the pirates, but they were sent back to Boston. There was a trial, and at that trial they were found guilty, and there were multiple hangings that ensued. Although half of them were pardoned by the government. Half of them were pardoned, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but John Quelch and a couple of others were hanged, and he wasn't repentant at the end. Uh, Cotton Mather, who was the minister who usually gave a sermon at all of these pirate trials and hangings, was hoping for them to say that they repented before they went off into the hereafter, yeah. but they didn't. You mentioned that Mather liked the camera, as we say oh, today. Oh, Mather but, was a, before there were paparazzi, I mean, he, he loved the attention. And whenever there was a major trial in town, be it pirate or otherwise, Mather would come running, give a sermon, and usually publish one of his sermons because he earned a lot of money from selling his sermons. And that was one of the major reasons that he liked to publish them is because he got nothing's out. changed. Nothing's changed, yeah. So <laughs> that that fascinated me. And uh, I read about uh, the Gloucester and right. um, and that history. I, did, I was not familiar with John Quelch before, although I read a lot of Gloucester history. Uh, he, he kind of passed through on his way to being on right. Boston. Right. I have one other question yes. about <clears throat> black flags, blue waters. And that concerns, there, there's a beautiful color plates in this book, by the way. Right. Which came out in 2018, I think. It did, yes. Uh, and you mentioned, quite up to date, Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie, yes. And uh, the are, are franchise. You and, I, and there is a picture, and I thought this was uh, Depp. I thought this was John Depp yeah. on this color plate, but it is not because it, you couldn't. Well, hey, you didn't have enough money to get a picture. Of no, it's not that I didn't have enough money. Is I contacted Disney, and they were willing to give me rights and have me pay for his image, but I had to get Johnny Depp's permission, and I tried to track down his agent, but I was unsuccessful. Oh. So, but but I'm happy that I came this across is, this. It's this an impersonator. An it's an impersonator who did a great job. It, it didn't, it didn't it cost me anything. It looks like it came, our viewers. It looks just like Johnny Depp. Yeah, it does, and it came from the Library of Congress. But that's one of the things that writers have to deal with. So it wasn't especially, No, no, it's a public domain image from the Library of Congress. So I had to, uh, as a writer, I, I, I like using images. I have a lot of images in my books. In part, I do that because I give a lot of talks on my books and people like slideshows so it's an yeah. easy way to have a slideshow oh, these are but pictures. one of the downsides of having images is a number of them have to be purchased now it's been less over time for my whaling book there are over a hundred images in that I had to purchase probably about 80 images the rights to publish them when that book came <coughs> out it cost me almost ten thousand dollars out of my own pocket to pay for the rights for the images that are in that book. Every book after that has been less and less. In fact, my um, the pirate book, most of the images are public domain, so it only cost me probably a couple thousand dollars to obtain the rights. But those rights, the money for that, comes out of the pocket of the author. It's out of my advance. Oh, really? So I have an incentive oh. for reducing the <laughs> amount of money that I have to spend. I, for a movie that I uh, created some years ago, we used, uh, I think, 20 seconds of uh, 
Captain's Courageous. Okay. And you had to pay for that? 300 bucks. Wow, yeah. Uh, wonderful pictures in that book. Thanks. And I want to turn now to the book that's coming out in six months. Sure. A Furious Sky. And we have a mock-up for the cover. A yes. Furious Sky, the 500-year history of America's hurricanes. Yeah, it starts with Christopher Columbus and goes all the way up to the very present. I, in the epilogue, well, this I... This is very, I, very appropriate now. Just oh, yeah. China is. The yep. Hurricanes are... Hurricanes, big story. I, the, in the epilogue, I talk about global climate change and how it's likely to affect the future ferocity of hurricanes. But really, the book is a history of meteorology, a history of politics, history of war, but everything done through the lens of hurricanes. All my books, the way that I look at them, they're all books about American history, and they use a specific topic as a backbone to tell a narrative arc. So even though it's about hurricanes, and there are a lot of very in-depth stories about hurricanes in there, it, uh, it uses the hurricanes as a way to take you from colonial times all the way up until the present. As you pointed out, the uh, history of John Quelch uh, is reflective of uh, law at the time. Right, law, privatization, religion. Uh, yeah. Interesting, it was just about how difficult it was to travel around and get things done. Yep. Really, really good background. Uh, hurricanes are really topical. Yes. Uh, is it, was it recent hurricanes and their violence and their, 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 their common occurrences now, uh, uh, inspired you to get on this book? Uh, no, most of my books are topics that I come up with. That was not. My uh, publisher, longtime publisher, W.W. W. Norton and Live Right, which is Live Right is part of W.W. W. Norton, my editor contacted my agent and asked him to ask me, uh, we, we often talk directly, but that's the way that this worked, if I would be interested in writing a book on hurricanes, because this is right after Maria, uh -huh. Harvey, Irma, there was this huge outbreak of hurricanes, and they thought that there'd be a good book on that. Fortunately, it landed on fertile ground, because I, had, I love, one of my favorite books is Isaac's Storm by Eric Larson, which is about the Galveston hurricane in 1900. And I had often thought that I wanted to write a book about a hurricane, but I hadn't found the right book. So when they came to me and said, do you want to write an entire book about the whole history of hurricanes? I you, was primed to say jumped. yes. So, yeah, so and it, how, it was fun. How long ago was that? Did that I, was, I signed the contract for that. Let's say, I, I, no, no, I handed in the book. <clears throat> I handed in the book June of 2019. So I signed the contract probably June of 2017. And it's coming out in it's coming out June of June 2020. of 2020. Yes. So you mentioned it's a struggle building a career. How long did it take you to get an agent? Uh, the agent story is kind of uh, funny. Uh, I I didn't have an agent for my first six or seven books, and when I decided I wanted to become a full time writer, a lot of people told me it's a good idea to get an agent. So at the time, I had just written a book. Uh, the Smithsonian Book of National Wildlife Refuges. So I contacted my editor at Smithsonian Books, and I said, do you know any literary agents? And he said, sure. I said, can you recommend three literary agents? He gave me three names. I looked them up. For whatever reason, I chose Russ Galen because I liked the kind of books that he represented. So I wrote Mr. Galen, or Russ as he's now my agent. I wrote Russ a one-page letter, I said I had an idea. I wanted to write a book about whaling. And I included in my letter a copy of my refuge book because I knew that he would like it because a lot of his clients were natural history writers. One of his main clients was David Sibley, the guy who writes the bird books. So I knew he liked birds. I knew he liked natural history. And I thought he'd like this beautiful coffee table book. So I sent it off to Russ. And about a week or two later, he called me up and he started talking to me. I told him about my whaling idea. We had a very nice conversation for about an hour and a half. Whoa. And at the end of it, I said, I really want you to represent me. And he said, absolutely not. And I said, why? <laughs> he goes, because you don't have, you're promising, you don't have a book. You don't have a proposal. You have a one page cover letter and you want to write a book about whaling in America, but you don't have a proposal yet. So come back to me when you have a proposal. And I told him, I said, 
okay, I understand that, but it's really important to me. I want to be represented. Can't you represent me? And we went back and forth and back and forth. And I think I wore him down and he said, okay, fine. I will be your agent, <laughs> but it doesn't mean anything because you don't have a book proposal yet. So he sent me a contract. I signed it. He was my agent. And about nine months later, I gave him a hundred page proposal for this whaling book. He, uh, Sent it out. Yeah, he, liked he, it. he liked it, and he <coughs> sent it out, and we got some publishers interested, and I ultimately but, decided to go with Norton. So I've been with Russ ever since. You're, you're a good salesman. There, you, you always hear the line: "You can't get an agent unless you publish. You can't publish unless you get an agent." Well, I had published about six or seven books without an agent, but none of them had been with a major publisher. Mm -hmm. And today it's even worse. I mean, you can get in the door without an agent, but I think the odds of getting one of the major publishers to even look at your work without an agent is very, very slim. And print shrinking. Print shrinking, it just, it's just because of the nature of the business. Agents act as gatekeepers and sort of quality control people. And they know the editors and they know what they'll like. So the editors and the publishers use agents as a way to winnow out this avalanche of material that they would otherwise get. Yeah. So they're not wasting their time looking through stuff that has not much promise. Right. So, uh, Have you started on the next book uh, after A Furious Sky? Uh, not really. I have a couple of ideas and I'm going back and forth with my agent and my publisher to settle on one of the ideas, but I haven't started. Can you started. share that or is that, that I, would be I, No, I, I don't share it. I, <laughs> Not until no, I have a contract No in spoilers. Okay. No spoilers. All I can tell you is that the odds are that it's going to be a maritime-themed book. You're in the right location. And, and that it'll definitely have some connection to Gloucester in some way or another, I think. Oh, good. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Yeah, okay, we'll that's see. good. That's a good hint. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to make sure before we close, uh, we've got a few yep. more minutes. Uh, I mentioned earlier I wanted to talk to you about the nuts and bolts of writing. Right. How do you get it done? I have talked to a lot of former students who say they just write when they're inspired. And if, I'd say, if I, <laughs> I said, well... <laughs> if I waited to get inspired, I don't think I'd ever finish a book because it's a job for me. I love it. It's the best job I've ever had. It's the hardest job I've ever had, but it is a job and it is difficult. The way that I do it is I have a lot of drive and determination. Uh, to give you an example, when I wrote my whaling book, I had a full-time job. I would wake up every morning <coughs> at three in the morning, drink a cup of coffee, work for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours before I drove to work. I would get to work at 5.30 in the morning here in Gloucester. I would work a full day. I'd go home, pick up my kids, deal with dinner, all that stuff. Kids would go to sleep, they were young kids at the time. And after that, I would work at night oftentimes, and my wife is very supportive, what? always has been, and she would give me every Saturday to write. What, what time did you go to bed to well, get up at three the next day? I'd often go to bed at 10 or 11. I didn't get a lot of sleep back then. I was really, I probably, it wasn't good for my health. I did it for two years. There were times where I had a tough, I drank a lot of coffee back then. I don't drink as much coffee now because I'm a full-time writer. I work in my house. I can put in a good eight hour day yeah. and still go to sleep and at do a normal you, do time. Do you not put in eight hour days? Oh stage? yeah, often more than that, yeah. When I'm really writing, I'll wake up. My wife, my wife goes to work at six in the morning. So I wake up sh shortly after that and I'll work until the end of the day. And both my kids, one of my kids <coughs> graduated college, the other one's in college, so they're not home. So I have less domestic duties. I cook all the dinners for my wife, and that's part of the deal for me staying home and, and working. Um, so Do you, you make sure you don't check your email 50 times a day or? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty focused. But really what it is, is I've got a goal, I've got a contract, I've got a deadline. I take contracts and deadlines very seriously. I also want to feel that I'm contributing to my family. And if I don't write a book, I'm not going to earn any money. So I really view it just as I have any other one of my jobs. I've got a job to do. I've got to finish it. And there are days when I don't feel like researching or writing, but I still go ahead and do it. Yeah. But there are some days that are better than others. There are some days I have where at the end of the day I go, oh, that was miserable. There are other days where... I'm writing like a fiend. 
So, but I'm not a believer in that ethereal, oh, I'm only going to yeah, write no, it when, the, when, it when, when, it when I'm work. inspired. Maybe fiction writers have more of that or have more need of that I know than with, nonfiction. With poetry, it's hard to tell whether you've got a, uh, had a good day or a bad day. Maybe possibly, <laughs> possibly you'll know in 400 years whether it's a good day or a bad day. And sometimes it looks great. And sometimes yeah. it looks like crap. And you don't know if that's the caffeine or, right. or the work. Yeah, know? I mean... And there's a lot of, re once I write a book, I mean, a lot of my time is spent researching, and I like researching. Uh, a lot of my time is spent writing, but what I've been doing more and more of as I get older, it's funny. When I used to write books and I'd finish it, I'd say, okay, I'm happy with it, and then give it to the editor. Now I spend a lot more time at the end of the process editing my own work. Like with this uh, pirate book, I finished it. I didn't hand it in to my publisher probably till two months after I had finished a complete manuscript. And that's because I kept going over it and tightening it and fixing it up. And I think I've become a better writer because I wasn't trained as a writer. The last English class I took was when I was in high school. And uh, I, I, I'm not a trained writer. So a lot of this is, I think, a combination of some natural talent, drive, determination. But I've become a better writer with experience. Do the publisher's editors... Yes to justify their job, even if they see a book that's been yeah. very well edited. Oh, they have a lot to, of suggestions. Try to, try to make changes oh, yeah. for, for their own sake? No, not for their <laughs> own sakes. My editors at, at Norton have been very good. And my main editor, they'll make substantive comments about, why don't you cut out this section? Could you add something on this? They're not doing the grammar so much. What happens is it goes to my main editor, they give me big picture comments that cause me to change the structure of the book, perhaps. And then it goes to a copy editor. I just finished the copy <coughs> editing process. The copy editor is like a very high level English teacher. And my copy editor this time was very good. And she went through it and she fixed all the dangling participles or whatever, phrases, the incorrect word usages. She tightened up a lot of sentences you, you get a, and, and get made the, the book a lot back better. With all the little tags on oh, the right. Hundreds, yeah. Made the book a lot better. Then it goes back to my publisher, which it, where it is right now. And now it's going to go through a line edit, which is another level of editing. And I'm going to get that back. And after that's done, I'm going to have to make more changes. So there's a lot of work that goes into it that is above right. and beyond what I do. I want to say I admire that energy and I admire that, uh, <laughs> that uh, dedication, that, that focus. We're almost Thanks. out of time. Okay. So I'm going to have to thank you formally, Eric J. Dolan, for being with us and talking about A Furious Sky, the book that's coming out in a few months, yep. and also Black Flags, Blue Waters, which... Yep. Mentions Gloucester and some of that. Yes. <laughs> Desperados who pass through Gloucester. Well, thanks for being with us. Well, thanks for inviting me. I want to thank you out there in television land as well for being with us on the writer's block. <clears throat> if you've learned something about Eric Dolan's work and uh, the part that Gloucester plays in some of it, then <laughs> the writer's block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night.